So moving into number two, and you kind of briefly touched on this in number one, what is the difference between a redundant asset and an operational asset? Yeah, so that's that's quite common in, in business valuation. So a redundant asset, it, it, it's like the name implies, it's an asset that's not required in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. So, you know, you can think of the very obvious ones, you know, in extreme cases, like I mentioned, you know, a ski boat, right. you know, it, you know, I, I, and I say it's extreme, but I have seen situations where, uh, <laughs> where people have done that, where, you know, they've, mm -hmm. um, they own, you know, assets such as a ski boat within their company on the basis that, hey, there is a small, maybe promotional aspect. Um, but, you know, in reality, it's not required in the business. And so that would be removed as a redundant asset um, in our analysis to clean up kind of the balance sheets in terms of what would a buyer actually buy. Because, you know, at the end of the day, they're not they're not going to be interested in buying those assets. And it can also be assets that are less um, straightforward, such as, you know, excess cash. Uh, you know, maybe this company has built up a large cash reserve. And it's just holding it in the company. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, you, you don't want to incur that tax uh, liability by by dividend it out to the shareholders. You just leave it there and defer it until needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, in our analysis, um, that might be something that we might consider redundant, um, as well as things like investments or even, you know, a shareholder debit balance. Maybe the company owes the shareholder money right. or, or there's related party loans, you know, things that, if you want to think about it, you know, if the business is not in the business of doing, like if the business is not in the business of lending people money, right. and therefore that would be considered redundant. Um, and, you know, when we're doing an analysis, I think one thing to keep in mind, especially around things like cash, is uh, you know, what are the company's liquidity ratios? How does its current asset ratio look like? What does its debt to equity ratio look like? And how does that compare to the industry? Or... Does it have um, existing debt facilities in place that, you know, say, hey, these are our covenants. You can't exceed X for your current ratio or Y for your debt to equity. And if by removing that cash on a notional basis, it um, breaches those covenants, well, that's an indication that cash is not redundant and it's required right. in the business. So we'll look at things like that as well um, to determine, you know, how much, you know, for example, cash is redundant or how much can can potentially be removed without putting that business in a uh, uh, in a bad spot. I think that's an interesting point. I don't think I've ever looked at it that way because I I know we get a lot of clients, you know, they get into that, you know, point in time in, you know, the business life cycle that you know around for a number of years, they've accumulated a bunch of cash. Maybe just looking at the balance sheet in general, you say, well, you got a pile of cash here, but maybe looking into those ratios in more detail gives you a bit more insight as to what is actually the excess or the redundant portion of that cash. Because then I think it's probably twofold. You can, you know, make some decisions as to what to do with the actual ac excess and then it probably also helps you in maybe having that discussion should CRA look at some of these things to say well we did some due diligence here and we said you know they've got a couple hundred thousand dollars here you might think it's excess but based on you know these working papers and these calculations they need this money to operate otherwise you know they're going to be in a cash crunch so that's a good point I think on that side. No, no, that's exactly it. And uh, I mean, this might be a bit off topic, but we actually, we see that scenario uh, or similar scenario a lot in terms of, uh, we do a lot of matrimonial work. And so when people have a business, often when it comes to uh, spousal support, you know, one party will be looking at the balance sheet and they'll see a large net income number and they want all that net income to be attributed for spousal support purposes. And, uh, and, you know, not every time, but sometimes we we have to, you know, after we analyze it, you know, we can see, hey, you know, this company, A, it can't distribute that net income. It needs to retain it because it has to service its debt. Right. You know, if it pulled it out, you'd be offside with your covenants or it needs to reinvest it for capital assets and and uh, and whatnot. And and so it's just another way that we, we often see this issue brought up. Um, because, uh, yeah, people sometimes get lost in terms of what bottom line net income is versus what, um, you know, is actually the reality of a company's cash flow situation. Right. 
yeah, and those two are very different just because you can net some dollars on the the income statement doesn't necessarily mean that the company's healthy overall. You might be really struggling in the cash flow department. So, yeah, that's another interesting point because I think a lot of times, you know, just like looking at that dollar value on the balance sheet, looking at that net income for, you know, split note disposal support, you know, that might not tell the whole story. There's a whole lot of cash flow items that are represented up in that balance sheet that need to be accounted for as opposed to just splitting out those monies for uh, disposal support payments. 